Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Are you ready to hack, everyone? Yes. Getting there, getting there. All right, so yeah, it depends how uh, excited I get, but um, yeah, what, what I wanted to do with this was to drop a few home truths about the state of crypto at the moment. And largely what I'm trying to sort of build the case for um, is a thesis I've been sort of thinking about, which is building for big V value. I'll explain what I think that that is. So what this is, is a bit of a story. I'm a bit older than the average crypto DJ and I've been around the block a little bit. I was an academic for, God, quite a long time, uh, about 15 years. I'm a physicist by background, but moved into um, decentralized governance, governance theory, learning theory. Uh, and I've been in crypto peripherally for about eight or nine years, but uh, about five years full time now. Uh, and I've seen some things. Um, this industry, I still think, is one of the most important things uh, in technology and is a deeply important uh, technological frontier that might do something really good for the world. But it constantly exasperates me. Um, so some of this is a bit of like uh, therapy session for me. I've been kind of unloading some of my uh, thoughts on this. Um, and I want a bit of life advice. I've made some or learned some mistakes uh, through some mistakes the hard way. I want to drop some of those on you. Uh, none of it is legal advice. This is just my opinion. So don't come at me for that. Um, and largely, I want to sort of unpack these a bit, right? So uh, these are the values of ETH Berlin. And um, when you're hacking, you will be judged against them. They are the lens by which um, you will be analyzed for your technology. So I'm actually going to unpack them. Uh, and synthesize th this with this thesis. And this is a bit of a call to action uh, to change the space a little bit. So the inspiration is I'm one of the nerds that still reads books. Um, and I was reading this philosophy text by a guy called Philip Goff. Um, and it's basically a kind of like, what's the point of all this, right? Standard philosophical question. But he sort of makes the argument that there might be a purpose to the universe. He's trying to carve out a little bit of um, philosophical ground between kind of God did it and none of it means anything. And his argument is that there's a kind of selective pressure on the universe for value. He calls it the value selection hypothesis. Bit of a weird aside, has anyone heard of cosmic fine tuning? Show of hands. Ooh. I'll take you down the cosmic rabbit hole at some point this weekend if you want me to. I'm going to touch on it a little bit here. I discovered this book. I recommend this book. It'll blow your minds uh, called Just Six Numbers by Martin Rees. Uh, and it turns out there's a few physical constants in the universe, six of them, um, that if they were a tiny little bit different, then like life wouldn't happen. In fact, the universe would be a very, very different place. If any of them were 1% different, then we wouldn't even be able to ask the question, what's the purpose of all this? Um, this crazy long number at the bottom tiny, tiny number, 10 to the minus 52, if one of those zeros were different, then the universe would expand at a different rate and we wouldn't have stars and we wouldn't have planets and nothing like life or value would exist. Um, so in this book, he basically makes the argument, and he talks about these things quite extensively, um, to make this argument that you know there's these numbers. I used to remember a lot of these as a physicist. Um, and they are values, and they're quite important. Constants, numbers. Um, and he goes through these things um, because the, you know, talking about them quite a lot and delineates between values with a small v, just numbers, and value with a big V, things that are good, uh, things that have value. Uh, and that's basically where I'm getting at with big V value. All right, back to crypto. We like numbers in crypto, right? Number go up. Uh, TVL, DAUs, numbers of transactions. We've even started to build points games that harness people's energy to drive up these numbers, right? It's all about fluffing the numbers up in time for the token launch. And this is what we've been optimizing for pretty much more than anything else. Uh, and it's got the, uh, got the sort of industry into a bit of a state. If anything, crypto is starting to look like the perfect manifestation of Goodhart's law. Uh, Goodhart's law is this idea that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Uh, and we get a load of this in crypto. The example on this little picture here is that, right, make me some nails, as many nails as possible. So people go and make lots of tiny little nails that aren't very useful. 
And so you go, all right, then make me some nails that weigh something, so I'll make some big nails that weigh a lot. And largely, that's where we've been getting, right? Everything's turned into a sort of Sybil factory to bump the kind of numbers, the reality of daily active users in crypto is a tiny fraction of what they really are, uh, because lots of users, the appearance of lots of users is good for the token launch. Um, and one of my mantras is basically like every game will be gained. And largely we've just turned the entire industry into a factory for gaming numbers. Um, and largely that's taken our eye off what we're actually, what's the purpose of all this, right? So what is big V value, the things that are good? Um, it's something that's actually good and that you could get broad consensus on it. Like if you go and, go and talk to someone in the street and say, what are you working on? Oh, I'm, I'm building this. And if it's an everyday person, they can say, oh, that sounds good. Um, then it probably is, right? Um, if you've built pump.fun and you're explaining that to a normie, they'll probably be like, what on earth are you talking about, right? And that's a good sign that you might be optimizing for the small v value. Um, so it's something that is useful, something that actually improves people's lives, uh, something that makes the world a better place, something that has a purpose. Sounds pretty obvious, right? But um, it's pretty difficult to look at the industry as a whole now and see what that is. In fact, it's a little bit worse than that, I would say. If anything, we have the inverse value selection hypothesis. Um, and we've managed to get ourselves into a position where attempting to do something that deviates just chasing these numbers is incredibly bearish, maybe even uninvestable, right? And that's a big problem because we've got this industry into a state where we're just chasing these number things around and actually if you start to actually look like you might be attempting to build something that's useful, that's a terribly bad idea. Some of these quotes here, Nick, we don't actually want FAIR. I spent quite a bit of time building FAIR launch technology, uh, things that stop pump and dumps on launch and things like that. And we're like, hold on a minute. We like the pump and dumps. Um, someone actually said that to me. Um, someone told me we don't buy fundamentals in bull markets. We only do that in bear markets. Uh, I've had literal VCs tell me I only buy scams in the bull market. And just go on, Nick, just play the game, will you? You know, stop trying to build stuff. And that's, that's like kind of an issue. Right? So what, what's the result? Right? I would say probably the most breakout crypto product of the year is dog with hat token, which kind of tells you where we're at. And we're kind of deep into the meme coin era. Um, we're discovering new realms of hyper degeneracy. If, if anyone's not looked at pump.fun yet, I suggest you go and have a look at it and just see what kind of madness is unfolding there. And, and it prints money, right? So it, it's working. But largely why are we here? I think we've got the Gary fear. Um, I think we've largely run away from doing real use cases because uh, doing anything legitimate attracts the kind of uh, oversight of, 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 of people. The more legitimate it might look, the more likely you are to get regulatory oversight. We, get, we have a kind of veil of decentralization, things that are, call themselves decentralized but aren't actually decentralized. In fact, we like the kind of asymmetry in the game. We like to be on this side of the game so we can extract value from the other side. Uh, we trace chens, trends, sometimes called meta-chasing, um, hyper-short-termism. Uh, no one really builds for anything that's after the token launch. We kind of got into this um, habit of just over-fetishizing infrastructure. We've just got more and more blockchains that don't particularly have, they're all general use case blockchains, so, subtle sort of changes in the proving system and what have you exploding greed ponzi's and we and, and you know we flushed out a lot of the the bad actors in the last cycle but i feel like we're starting to manifest this again with incredibly low float uh, token economies you know we're launching blockchains in the tens of billions on day one and that's just rigged essentially to sort of draw um retail action in so insiders can dump their bags and largely, we're, we're kind of well on track to be Wall Street, but worse, uh, which is really not the point of all this. Um, so it didn't used to always be like this. Um, when I first discovered crypto in the kind of early days, I used to treat, teach cryptography many years ago, and I, and I was fascinated by this era of the cypherpunks. Crypto used to have a very clear value set. It was a very much about um, cryptography. It was about... Um, challenging centralized power structures. It was about free and open source software. And I came here 
and left a 20-year academic career, essentially, to join crypto. Uh, and I did that because I felt like it was a path to disrupt institutional governance. I was building a kind of decentralized organization before DAOs were a thing. I was decentralization pilled and thought, this is it. We've got the technology now to take this onto the open internet. And largely, um, I think we've just been kind of um, not living up to this, and it's a real shame. We've got an opportunity now to, to do, the, do some important stuff, and we've not taken it yet. And honestly, it's about time we started doing it, because uh, the context at the moment is looking uh, pretty grim. Uh, authoritarianism is hot right now. Division and attention-based attention mimetic warfare. This is the year, like, half of the world is voting. It's going to get grim. And, you know, the, we're, we're in a kind of fake news bonanza. The world is getting messier and more complex. And the dawn of AI is right on our doorstep, and it is incredibly centralized. The, it came out yesterday that Sam Altman rugged half of his employees that decided to um, say something bad about OpenAI, and there was three signatures on it, and it was Sam Altman, Sam Altman, and Sam Altman. Um, so these systems are incredibly centralized, and we could be heading for even more centralization. And there's this kind of war to capture global identity, which is a key theme of this week. Um, so I want to say kind of, what's the way out of this then? Like, how do we move this industry into meaning something a little bit more than just vapid numbers, right? Instead of just these the pure number go up speculation. And largely we've got to this point where the more closer to nothing but numbers, the better. And my argument is, is basically it's values. Now, this is just one value structure and it's the one I'm gonna talk about. You, I would suggest you can play around with this and, and build your own. But actually having a strong value structure for what you're building will keep you on track. I've seen a lot of people come in with these and then sort of just give up. After a, after a couple of years or something, and the kind of reality of the industry bites a little bit, and then just like go, all right, then I'll just do a meme coin or whatever. So really try and think about what, what values mean to you, and I'll, I'll dig into these, because we can use them as a lens on which they do, and actually you want to be building these into your hacks, it will improve your chances of winning. Uh, so read the hacker manual, absorb that. Um, so yeah, let's dive into these. I think privacy, um, is under attack. I think it's fair to say um, that is true. Um, we are in a world where governments are trying to ban end-to-end -to -end encryption. Uh, the online safety bill has just passed in the UK. There's a similar one in the EU. Um, and they're kind of trying to build arguments that only kind of like criminals and, and like predators use end-to-end -end encryption. And they're trying to manipulate public perception um, into demonizing encryption. And that's a, that's a big problem, right? And we've got to be mindful of the context that that's happening. Uh, the tornado cash case has just been settled. Um, and part of that narrative was the, the idea that privacy, the, the words were like, there is no legitimate use to tornado cash. Um, and that's a big problem, right? Because they're saying that. Uh, there was no legitimate use for privacy. Um, so what I want you to think about is how can we prove that there is legitimate use cases for privacy? Prove to people that there is a need for privacy and build legitimate use cases for it. And I will say, please, um, avoid biometrics on the blockchain. Um, I've thought about this a lot. Um, anyone who knows me will know I'm a hugely critical of WorldCoin and related technologies. Attesting your biometrics to a blockchain is a terrible idea. Um, I'm equally uh, not a fan of things like ZKKYC. Um, most of those schemes tend to just involve you bringing your passport, sending it to a centralized server and getting some kind of proof. Well, there's a billion people on this planet who don't have IDs. Crypto is always meant to be for those people. So build for those people. Um, usable. Um, there's a kind of phenomena in crypto that we kind of build for ourselves, right? 
Um, if you're in this building, you're probably of the kind of nerdier persuasion of people who like to run bare metal code and things like that. Um, now, what we're sort of building for is the in-crypto bubble, if you like. And actually, crypto moves at such an incredible pace um, that actually it, the, the barrier to entry for understanding how to use this stuff is just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So um, we're building what I call public asymmetric games, where fine, it's open and transparent, but actually um, there's only a sort even subset within the crypto bubble who really understand how it works, and that actually generates the alpha in the token economy. Uh, which can make for these kind of open extractive games. Um, so yeah, just be mindful of when you're building these things, you might be further alienating the outside world. Um, and actually we need to start thinking about building for real people um, because we need to open up and break out of the, of the bubble that we're in to prove to the world this actually means something because we are under attack, right? People want to stop this industry from happening and that gets harder and harder and harder if there's good real world use cases that we can actually build around. So yeah, a bit of advice. I would say think about how you can build real people into your feedback loops. Um, think about actual um, humans and, and like taking that out into the, into the real world. Abstract away the blockchain as much as possible. You know, chain abstraction is a big thesis at the moment, uh, as is account abstraction. Uh, take away that UX complexity, but also build in education. Like there's an opportunity here to educate the the people that you're who are using your applications uh, on the way through. Um, permissionlessness is one of the most interesting aspects of this industry, and is um, it means that you don't need centralized parties, right? Regulations are coming, and a lot of them tend to be like okay, send all of your code before you deploy it to this centralized um, group who will say it's okay and then you can do it. Uh, and what we're actually doing is essentially uh, intermediating all of our tools again. And yeah, direct tools don't ask for permission. There's something you can create code here and publish it and really no one can stop you. And that's an that's a important thing to do, but it also comes with a degree of responsibility. Um, so yeah, think about that. And show people that code is speech, right? Open source, free and open source systems are not going away. Uh, we're in a terrible, terrible state if anyone can stop people publishing code in the future. And people are trying to do it. The, the, um, the EU AI Act in particular is, um, has some bits in it which are there that will like, sit, they'll literally make GitHub take down open models, and things like that. So we need things like a decentralized GitHub if that sort of goes down like that. Um, so yeah, think about systems that will actually make code speech. Subversive. I built a sort of career about like speaking truth to power. I would talk, my job became talking to academics and academics have this kind of ability to um, think they're right all the time. <laughs> and um, it was one of these things where I sort of realized there is a need to, to challenge established power structures all the time, basically. So we have them in crypto, right? We have big centralized entities that do a lot of the power wrangling. If anything, there's quite a lot of hyper-centralization in crypto. Um, challenge those structures as much as you can. Um, like I said earlier, authoritarianism is, is getting pretty pretty big at the moment and could get worse, um, it becomes impossible if people have the tools to uh, not be controlled. Um, the, the real scary thing that can happen is when there is um, a centralized control system somewhere that can control many people at a distance. Right? So if I can have my movement um, restricted, if I can have my bank account shut down, if I can be controlled and surveilled at a distance, then people will do it, right? The, the, the power to control the masses uh, is too, too juicy not to deploy, right? It makes things easy, uh, and people will use the kind of, the, the excuse of a crisis of any kind to be able to deploy them. But the tools that we're building here make that very difficult to do if they're mass adopted enough, right? So 
it can make authoritarianism possible, and we might have alternative, alternate systems ready for if things genuinely go to shit, right? If things go wrong and there's somewhere else to go, that's less of a problem. So that doesn't mean, you know, attack existing systems, that's generally a bad idea. Disrupt these systems by just being better than them. Um, all right, social. This is about real people and real problems, and largely uh, crypto, again, has built itself this kind of in-bubble uh, reality that's becoming, if anything, a little bit further and further removed from, from everyday people. If you saw that video, a uh, um, recent um, graduation ceremony where some guy mentioned Bitcoin and everyone started booing. Um, our public perception is in the pits at the moment. And we need to start thinking about what these real social systems are uh, and contextualize what we're doing in the real world. So think about that interaction between the local and the global. Last year, I came here with the quadratic voting technology for, the, to, for judging the hackathon. And this year, we're taking it into the people of London. We're, we're running citizens' assemblies, which is explicitly trying to do a DSI experiment with a cross-section of people. Uh, and we're trying to build a kind of decentralized AI representative of those people by harnessing their, their thoughts and ideas in a kind of permissionless and open deliberative system. Um, it's really difficult. It's difficult to get real people. It's difficult to build technologies that grannies can use, but it's making our technology better for doing it, right? If you can actually build things for real people, it makes you better at what you're doing, and it makes you realize what actually is important for the world. So think about um, the real people. Don't be afraid about building local. Um, if you can think of a shared context amongst your hacker group that you want to build around, I would do that. Think about real case studies and real people that this might connect to. Clandestine is an interesting one. Um, secrecy. You know, we're all here, we're all public. It's actually very difficult to be super secret now. I think it would be basically impossible to pull off the Satoshi release now. I don't think it's possible to genuinely launch technology and not leave some kind of digital trace. You'll notice most of these hackers that are rugging DeFi systems and stuff get kind of gripped pretty quickly now. And that's because they get doxxed, right? Everyone leaves a digital trail. So yeah, secrecy is difficult, but it doesn't mean that you can't build Trojan horses, the good kind, right? Don't build the bad kind. And by that, I mean, you can have tools that have multiple motivations. So you can build a nice, friendly, usable application that's nice and easy to use on the surface, but underneath it has a deeper message that you're trying to convey, and then you can adopt people into something that's a little bit more interesting and challenging to centralize power. So a fun game can teach people important lessons if it's designed right. So disruption isn't always welcome. So find subtle ways in. Be tactical, right? So tactics is a really important thing. Think about how you can be tactical in order to do it. This one, independence, is incredibly important. So waiting around for permission in crypto is a great way to die. Um, I've been watching people trying, you know, particularly in the real world asset space, the amount of people who built stuff, they're like, yeah, we're just waiting for all the laws to change and then I can tokenize this land or whatever. Uh, and they died years ago, right? Just waiting around for some rules to change is a great way to run out of money and die, right? So being autonomous, don't build systems that is reliant on someone saying, okay, you can do that, right? So think about how you can be autonomous. Understand the power dynamics at play, both in crypto and out of crypto. There is um, always power around you, uh, and, the, and what we're building here is a way to challenge it. Remain independent for as long as possible. I think the world would be an incredibly better place if there's a legion of hackers working as completely independent people building tools that are good for the world. Be careful who you work for uh, or get challenged by and collaborate with. There are sharks out there. I've had deep run-ins with many of them. Be anti-corporate. There are people out there that will absolutely steal your code, uh, lie to your faces, try and trap you in horrible contracts. Watch out for them. And if you're engaging in any of that kind of stuff at the moment, do find me over the weekend and we can talk about it. 
But yeah, there's some pretty well-known bad actors in this industry. And thinking about your independence and keeping these things independent is incredibly important. And largely, I see DAOs as a huge part of maintaining that independence for people. Be impactful. So I recently have been running a course at the Architecture Association in the UK, which is about sort of reclaiming common land using things like DAOs and tokenized land. As part of that, uh, my students have done a bunch of crypto stuff. They get judged in a panel, it's all done by a viva, and every now and again they get a crypto skeptic on their panel who've been like brainwashed by people like Stephen Deal, who wrote a blog post called, Yes, Crypto is All a Scam. And largely people have, have sort of got it, this into their heads, right? The way we get around that is by impact. How is that impact going to manifest? If you can think about the impact in the real world in your hacks, I think that's going to be really valuable for, for helping you improve and get better. Secure. Um, I think it, it's, um, you've got to think about your security. And by that, think about your attack surface. Think about what happens when it gets big. Optimizing for TVL generally means let's get a billion dollars aped into this smart contract, right? That's generally not a great idea. Um, think about risk. This is an industry that moves fast, but think about what the safety belts are. And I think having that present in your work is going to be important. Libra, last one. So um, free and open source software is a way for people to get out of centralized control. Um, free speech is under attack. Um, the best way to get a paranoid person to be more paranoid is to censor them and to take down their ability to have free and open discourse. Build technologies that allow that to happen, but think about curation, which was touched on in the previous talk. There are forces at play for re-intermediation. Um, if we wanted to do Lemonade DAO at the moment, there'll be people out there who think you should set up a Cayman Islands foundation and spend $200,000 on legal fees. Actually, uh, we should be driving the cost of coordination to zero. Uh, setting up a DAO should cost you nothing more than gas fees. Um, so reduce the cost of compliance, reduce the cost of coordination. All right, uh, what I'll be doing over the weekend, I'm looking for you to inspire me. I'll be looking at all of your submitted projects, and I'm just thinking about what, I what is this continuum of big V value, right? I think this, one of the under-explored under things is like education, decentralized educational practice. That's all going upside down because of AI. Think about how that's going to change. DSI, democratic AIs, which is my current thing. If anyone wants to talk about that, do grab me over the weekend. And then, you know, there's things over here, like the thing I could think of the smallest fee value is actually racist meme coins, which unbelievably was a thing this year. So yeah, think about where you might fit in on this continuum. Uh, and there's something even worse than, than just building for numbers. Um, and which is the worry about actually building sort of dystopia toolkits which might help centralized power get even more centralized and powerful. So, yeah, watch out for them. So, uh, finally, what can you do for building for big V value? Don't let people scare you out of DAOs. A lot of centralized power don't like them because they actually decentralize things. I think it's the way that we can get big protocols, funding real people, doing real things, and remaining independent. Hack decentralized governance. We need to know how we can govern AIs in a decentralized way, probably the most important project on the planet at the moment. Build orbless identity systems. Uh, think about plurality. Build for collective intelligence. Um, build sustainable economies. How do you stop rug pulls from being possible? And change the game. This is the space to build intentionally off market. What we're building here is an intellectual exercise. So challenge these norms. Build for the commons and build something that matters. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I've got time for questions. Hello, mate. Hey, hello, hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, quick and practical question since here are the builders and they will do stuff. What kind of use cases you see within the 
this weekend that could tackle potential AI challenges and values challenges at the same time. AI challenges and what was the other one? Yeah. Values challenges because it, it could be attacked from another side. Okay. Values, yeah. values. Um, so particularly on the AI front, the you'll have noticed recently like the Microsoft have just started using ads as sources, right? So the centralized AIs control the kind of source of truth, right? So we're in a position where we've got this hyper-centralization where everything is getting funneled into these models. The whole history of human language has already been scraped and is all buried into these things and is coming out through a single text box. So we've literally now got a centralized source of truth that's controlled by corporates. And they're starting to sort of, you know, advertising is one of these things, but more insidiously, they can shape the nature of truth. Uh, in that is, they're doing that via the system prompt, which is largely just a list of instructions to tell the AI how to think, right? Don't give the user this, tell the user that. Um, decentralizing system prompts, we, you know, there's like decentralized compute is one thing, but think about decentralized governance of models. How do you decentralize the data pipeline? How do you think, keep these things credibly neutral? And how do we challenge the oligopoly, basically? What is the way in which we can give free and open source models to everyday people? Because in order to run Llama 3 at the moment, you need a, like a, 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 a three grand GPU, right? Most people don't have access to that hardware. So how can you decentralize access to these things I think crypto is one of the ways to do it because you can hypergranularly price the generations, right? The unit economics of these things can be done with tokens. So yeah, decentralize the governance layer, decentralize the system prompts. Think about private local access. Uh, there are open models out there you can be hacking with this weekend. Um, get some local models running and think about access around that stuff. But yeah, really, really important problem. Um, any? Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Great talk. Um, as an educator, uh, what do you mean by decentralized education? Yeah, that's a, it's a good one. Um, so, yeah, just to contextualize education at the moment, I was a director of learning and teaching and uh, an associate dean in that sort of area. And it was my job to... Um, Govern the kind of assessment and curriculum portfolios, right? Most universities and places of education have like 80% of their assessment portfolios as essays. And they're at the moment just telling their students, don't use AI, you're not allowed, right? And of course they are, all of them are. So think about new assessment practices. What does assessment look like in the world of AI, right? Um, I think you can do massive scale peer to peer assessment of them. How do we decentralize curriculum? How do we match make uh, educators with people all over the world? I think if we crack this right, we'll discover mathematics geniuses in like refugee camps, right? We'll, we'll, we'll find people and educate people who don't have access and largely av avoid putting degree certificates on the block blockchain or any personal information for that matter. But if you're just incorporating existing, existing systems of power and credentialization, you're kind of defeating the point. So how do you bring someone into an education system that's really decentralized, maybe even maintains pseudo-anonymity, and I can build a reputation that proves I know about our subject in our discipline without you know, proving that I'm a, a physicist or whatever. And decide, like, I, I got a PhD in physics like many years ago, but an undergraduate would destroy me at the moment on physics. It doesn't mean anything anymore. So yeah, decentralized credentialing, reputation systems, peer-to-peer uh, -peer education practices, all that kind of stuff. Hi. Uh, I want to say I think you're the first person I ever saw mention um, be careful of sharks in the crypto industry because anyone that's worked long enough in crypto has probably had like a close encounter with a shark or a wolf in sheep's clothing. So I'm wondering um, if you're allowed to talk about it. What do you personally do when you've encountered someone, especially someone that's like deeply entrenched in crypto, who's a, a bad actor? I would say, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, use your peer groups. Um, ask your founders talk, right? So if you're talking to people, uh, if you're interacting with people, ask around as much as you can, 
right? Have you had any interactions with these people? And largely, you'll find people who give you an honest answer. The, one of the challenges is a lot, lot of times this gets kind of legal, right? And unless you're incredibly like the lead, there's a couple of things that you have to deal with the asymmetry of. One is lots of money versus not much money, right? If you're a bootstrapping startup and you're trying to wrestle with a tiger that's got infinite money, they will leverage that financial power over you to run you into the ground essentially and try and get you for cheap. So don't be stuck with a single one, right? So don't feel like you've only got the, you know, this like, oh, we're going to talk to this big name, this big group. That's, that's like super good. It's going to make us, right? Actually, no, there's lots of money in crypto and there's lots of other places to go. Don't ever get stuck in this group. And largely, like, try and get as much free legal advice as you can if you can't afford it, right? Largely, you can like literally ring up lawyers and ask them for advice, and and sometimes they'll just cough it up as much as you can for free. You will get like a free consult consultation from a lot of them as possible. But yeah, don't get trapped into a thing, and don't sign anything you're not comfortable with ever. Don't be afraid to walk away, and talk to your friends. If you've if you've uh, experienced something bad, one of these wolves, tell everyone about it. Right? Don't be afraid to 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 go public if you like. So yeah, like, feel free to talk to me about this over the weekend if any of you are wrestling with this stuff. All right, I think that's it. Thanks very much, everyone.